Welcome back, everyone. I am Cass Pianci. I'm joined as usual, <laughs> after a long time, uh, by my partner in crime, Mr. Bennett Tomlin. How are you today? I'm glad to be here. How are you, Cass? Hanging in there. It's uh, we picked a hell of a day to record. It's um, possibly the worst storm of the of the year. So that's uh, had power outages and all that, but. For now, we're good, um, and we're just going to try to get through this. Today, we're talking about what is known as essentially uh, our favorite topic or our least favorite topic, depending on how you view it. Um, we are talking about Tether, and we're talking about Tether, I think, more just to review how far we've come or how little we've actually gone <laughs> since the very beginning, um, because Tether is nearing or has surpassed roughly 100 billion at market cap, I guess we'll say, I'd, that there are 100 billion tethers, which are, you know, equivalent to $100 billion. So, um, yeah, we're talking about that and we're talking about how we got here. So, so Bennett, I think it's important. The Q4 attestations just came out. Can we kind of talk about that before we even delve into the 100 billion number? The quarter four attestation shows that Tether is one of the most systemically important financial firms in the entire globe, making billions of profit every single quarter going directly into their control. They are making massive investments across a wide variety of industries, energy, mining, payment, Tron staking through Luga nodes, um, tons of these different ventures, all of which they expect to pretty immediately drive financial results for this firm in the overall ecosystem as a whole. Besides that, they've been able to direct hundreds of millions of dollars directly into Bitcoin. It's 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 the perfect storm. Crypto grows, Tether grows, Tether buys Bitcoin, Bitcoin grows, crypto grows, Tether grows, Tether buys Bitcoin. It's a virtuous cycle. It is the super cycle. Maybe. <laughs> well, they they just lost their shirts again. So so I don't know. I don't know. Or I guess not. They didn't really lose their shirts, but they're they are shutting down the. Um, you're talking about Suzu and Kyle Davies, obviously three AC, um, who got caught up in the super cycle, which is pretty much what Bennett was just describing. However, movement... Suzu wasn't wrong. He was just early. Early. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, what is it? Isn't the isn't the other the second part of that phrase that if you're early, you might as well be wrong. Anyway, there was a tweet that I saw that had uh, stated that Tether had earned more in quarter four than Goldman Sachs, um, which is just such an interesting categorical error. It's such an interesting categorical <laughs> error. Is that what you were about to say? Well, such an well, interesting can, example of fallacious reasoning. Is, is that well, where you were you, going? Can you get in? Let's get into that. Can you talk about why, why you're saying that? These types of firms like Goldman Sachs, generally when they're discussing their profits, they're discussing the corporate profits accrued to Goldman Sachs itself, not the appreciation of whatever funds or activities Goldman Sachs has their hands in. When Tether says profits, they mean our money market fund that's not a money market fund went up by this many dollars. Their assets under management effectively kind of uh, increase that much. Goldman Sachs, when they say profits, they mean the Goldman Sachs shareholder entity earned this much money. So the right metric really wouldn't be to look at Goldman or something. The real metric would be to look at like a money market fund. Well, it, and to be clear, Tether by that categorization is still fucking massive. A $100 hmm. billion dollar money market fund is a fucking massive money market fund. And we've talked about on here before, back in like 2008, 65 billion was systemically important for mm -hmm. the reserve primary fund when Lehman Brothers was unable to roll their commercial mm -hmm. paper, right? And so that was 65% of the size Tether is currently. So even in the categories that Tether exists in, Tether is massive and important. I just think that there's a bit of a categorical error, categorization error, when people try to compare what Tether calls profits to what some audited and recognized firms call profits. I think that's a, that, that is a really fair um, acknowledgement and, and important. I think also when you reflect on like just the numbers of employees that I, like Goldman has, I think like 70,000 employees and uh, 
Tether has like 11 or something. Um, so yeah, there's just really, they're not the same kind of business. You're right. And that, that, that was an unfair, um, comparison, but it is still a comparison that was made and one that kind of gave everyone pause. I think it does show that Tether is massive. Tether is important and Tether is a new type of financial firm. And I was being a little bit glib when I was quickly summarizing Tether's recent assurance results and some of their investments and stuff like that. But there is a little bit of stuff there that's worth digging into a little bit, like uh, Tether's more recent investment activities. And Tether has been investing and doing venture type investing for years, right? They were one of the investors in Samson Mao's Exordium token sale for the developers of the Infinite Fleet video game. They led the Series A round for Celsius, and if you believe Jason Stone would later step in to try to bail it out as well. Um, what's new is now Tether is much more public about announcing when they're doing various investments, and they claimed in their newest blog post that there is a new segregated VC umbrella that they're doing this under. They didn't disclose the name, the executives, the structure, or anything right. about that structure, but we were told it exists. Um, so that's one of the things Tether's doing recently. And they're also still playing games with words. Like one of Tether's commitments was that in 2023, they were going to remove secured loans from their reserves. Now, you may look at their most recent assurance and say, wait a second, there's still over $4 billion in secured loans. And Tether would say, Almost ah. $5 billion, yeah. Yeah, Tether would say, aha, you've fallen for our trick, you see, because we don't call those reserves anymore. Those are excess reserves, a whole new thing. They don't count anymore um now you may say tether excess reserves has reserves right there in the name but alas here we are it's funny how our first episodes were about tether um and the issues that we saw with tether at the time I, people have made points about these you know auditors reports which i think that's another thing we should point out like these are called independent auditors reports they're not audits they don't say audit they're not an audit. They're not um, they're not even like an attestation, really. Like these are auditors reports. It's a completely different categorization. We've talked about this before, but it's probably been over a year since we've talked about tether audits and things like that. And they're still not audits and they still fall to the same criticism then, which is tether management provides a set of documents to the auditors, which are tasked with a relatively narrow question. Are there assets in these accounts that seem to match up at this time with the number of tethers in circulation? And the auditors say, according to the documents we got, yes. Right. And, and that's that's what those assurances have been since the New York Attorney General settlement and before that, too. But And so there's still pretty big limitations to that. We still haven't gotten the audit that Stu was promising in 2021, and Paolo, the new CEO of Tether, has kind of stopped promising that as much. They're still working on it, but in the kind of ambiguous way that involves not mentioning who's doing it, when they're doing it, or what's it going to look like. I mean, would you say it's fair to say that at least we have I guess not, right? Because we don't, this is not an audit. This is not an actual attestation. This is just these auditors taking their, taking the word of management at Tether. So do we have more insight than we used to have? Or is this just us feeling like we do because they're saying this is what they have? I think we do have more insight than when we started this podcast. We started this podcast like shortly after the New York Attorney General settlement is when we started it. We didn't know at that time who Tether's partners were beyond Dell Tech. We hadn't gotten any of the assurances they started issuing after that settlement, really. Now, Cantor Fitzgerald is willing to make statements that suggest they hold lots of Tether's reserves. Uh, we know some of their banking partners we have a better idea of some of their structure and there is a plausible mechanism now by which tether would be making the money they claim to be making right and so some of that part makes more sense now than it did when we started this podcast however there are still a bunch of outstanding questions that were issues when we started this that are still issues right there's still no audit there's still like the open question of at what times did tether have what assets and how did that like 
How did those assets arrive under Tether's general control? Since we started this podcast, some of the statements that were still questions then later resolved as us being right. Like the CFTC settlement illustrated that Tether was backed only one day out of four in the 26 month period that they looked like according to like Tether's own statements and stuff. And we gained greater insight into like a uh, to be to be clear, fully backed. Like they, they're yeah, backed as described. There were there were assets there, but they they, they weren't, weren't backed as fully described. backed one to one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The tension for me with Tether now is that I think it is plausible to say that Tether and Tether related entities control somewhere close to a hundred billion in assets, valued somewhere close to fairly. Which means the outstanding questions are: How did those assets get there? Like, why are those assets there? And is the core business being run in a way where it can continue to operate? Meaning, have they found a way to avoid regulator and law enforcement pressures? Avoid or comply with, right? When we started this, I think a lot of the the pushing from people like us and, you know, others, Bitfinex and other, others who um, were trying to be pretty precise with what they wanted to see from Tether and Bitfinex, um, largely centered around audits. And one of the things I keep thinking about is how they've repeatedly promised those those audits. Um, so they promised them, I think they promised them ultimately like six or seven times over all these years. What I think is really interesting about that is the, the constant excuse that they use when they can't get the audits is auditors just won't do it. They won't work with us to get these audits done. They're being too, uh, I think you, you've mentioned recently about the Friedman LLP um, audit that was going to happen where they, they were like, they're being just, they're digging in way too much. They're, they're checking too much stuff out, which is like, that doesn't make sense, right? That's how an audit works. They keep saying they're going to get the audits. Then when the audits don't happen, they keep saying it's the auditor's fault. It's not our fault. But then I keep thinking, why are you promising the audits over and over again then? And, and like it gets even more frustrating than that when you pay attention to the specifics of what Tether executives will promise. Right. Let's go to let's talk about Stuart Hogner for a second. Yeah, Everyone's please. favorite bald lawyer in 2021. Stuart Hogner took to Twitter to again assure everyone that they were working on audits and that they would be coming soon, although he could not provide an exact timeline. And what angers me the most is that he said that the audits would start with the 2018 financial year. And the reason this makes me so mad, and again, go back to those early episodes to really understand this, is that 2018 would be a year in which Bitfinex would take hundreds of millions of dollars from Tether's reserves in undisclosed related party transactions in order to cover up their own effective insolvency after giving over $1 billion to an unlicensed money transmitter operated, operated out of Panama and Colombia. After this uh, undisclosed transaction to cover up Bitfinex's insolvency left Tether unbacked, the New York Attorney General would begin investigating, and when the New York Attorney General reached out, Bitfinex and Tether would then enter into a revolving line of credit agreement where Tether would extend almost a billion dollars of, of credit to Bitfinex to cover up this effective insolvency, and the same executives signed this loan agreement for both sides. And Stuart Hogner, in 2021, after the New York Attorney General settlement, took to Twitter to assure people that this that specific year is the year in which their audits would start, that they would be able to provide full financial audits for that year that would definitively show Tether was continually backed during a year when we already objectively know Tether was 100% not backed. That is offensive that the lawyer <laughs> thought that that was a believable line to tell in public and that no one fucking cares. Yeah, well, that's the part that I think is the most interesting is that they've actually been able to repeat the same lie, right? And and or maybe it isn't a lie. Well, I, one part of this is absolutely a lie. The the idea that the audit is always months away for about 7 years or whatever is clearly a lie, right? Like clearly that is simply not true. Sure ain't and, a truth. But so the but then the alternative like when I think about it I'm like okay, if the if the auditors really cuz they're I well I guess there's Coinbase, but Coinbase doesn't operate a business like uh Tether does certainly. 
I think everyone will admit that that is at least true and that a lot of what Tether has done, whether you like them or not, because I'm sure there's plenty of people out there who listen to us and feel like, you know, Tether's not so bad. Um, I think it's worth noting that a lot of the stuff they've done is unsavory at best and even illegal at best, right? Because they've been fined and slapped down for the for the stuff that they've done. They were monitored by the New York Attorney General for years because of how they behaved. So whether you like them or not, you can admit that they're unsavory characters doing illegal things. And the reason they can't get these audits isn't because they're trying desperately to get them and the auditors are just like, oh, sorry, can't do it. I, I really don't, I, we haven't seen any proof that they've been seeking out auditors in any realistic way whatsoever to get an audit. And I, I don't think they have ever. I think that is the reality. I don't think they want to get an audit. I don't think they've tried to get an audit really. And, uh, I wish they would, I like, these are the lies that they utilize to just fool people. They gaslight like the entire public and it works, you know, where they're just like, we were trying desperately to get an audit. And it's like, how could you be trying desperately for seven years and it doesn't happen? What especially makes me angry, going back to that like Stu thing I just said, is he could have simply stated, having resolved these previous issues, we intend to like start an engagement going forward from this date, covering this period or whatever that will like deal with the future right let the past be past i say discussing 2014 on a podcast in 2024 <laughs> let the past be past and but instead he didn't he said no actually you know that year where you just heard we were doing all that unsavory stuff we had to pay millions of dollars to settle lawsuits about yet yeah, no actually the lawsuit's going to cover that period cool huh you recently discussed how it's not even just tether Right, it's Bitfinex as mm -hmm. well, which by the way, I don't know, there's really no separation between these entities. I think it's fair to say that while they conduct themselves differently, they're different so, yeah. businesses. Actually, but... no, th this gets back into the Friedman audit that you were kind of talking about in a way that I think is really compelling because um, back in 2017, Bitfinex had been promising an audit after the 2016 hack because they had come up with this cockamamie scam to give everyone a bunch of BFX tokens instead of the money they were actually owed. And you can go back again to our early episodes to really get into the weeds on that. But as a byproduct of this process, there was a bunch of Bitfinex users who accused Bitfinex of either keeping back some corporate funds or not giving everyone the same haircut. In order to assuage these fears, Bitfinex agreed to a full financial audit and that they would publish their haircut methodology to prove that every user got the same haircut. Initially, they would retain Ledger Labs to do this analysis. Ledger Labs is not a financial auditing firm and never could have done a financial audit, but did seem to do a security report that would leak, I think, last year and would show that it was Juan Carlo Davisini's keys that seemed to be responsible for the hack. Um, sorry, we don't technically know that. It was just a key named Juan Carlo. It could have been a different Juan Carlo <laughs> working there. Um, maybe. <laughs> Can't say it was the Davisini Juan Carlo. Uh, but uh, there was also around the same time reporting from Nathaniel Popper that showed that not everyone got the same haircut, but Bitfinex couldn't get their financial audit from Ledger Labs. Tether announced that they had retained Friedman LLP to do an audit for them, and then Bitfinex announced that they had retained Friedman LLP to do an audit of them. Cass, you were talking about how there was no separation between the firms, and I think that was especially true back here in this period in 2017. We've talked about before, Tether's redemption window was not open from April 2017 until November 2018. All redemptions and issuances of Tether were primarily done through Bitfinex. And so especially in this period, I think if Tether wanted to get an audit, there was going to need to be an audit of Bitfinex for the auditor to feel confident that they had adequately audited Tether, you know? Yeah, And so what we eventually get to is the manipulated Friedman report where Tether moves a bunch of money into a bank account, has Friedman check it, money comes back out. And the uh, 
eventual news that the Tether relationship with this auditor dissolved because of the excruciatingly detailed procedures they wanted to do. My intuition is that the excruciatingly detailed procedures they insisted on was auditing the sister firms of Tether that were holding Tether assets in order to make sure that there was no other like encumbrances or liens against those assets. And the reason we've never seen audits of either of these firms is there has not been a period where their financial situations have been disentangled enough that they've been able to cleanly get an audit on either firm. That's my intuition about what happened then and one of the barriers that still prevents them from getting it. I mean, we're getting into the weeds of the auditing and the not auditing and the attestations and what they promised and what they haven't done. Er earlier, you said, or collaborating with law enforcement. And I or yeah, complying, complying with complying. Yeah. And I thought that was an interesting direction. Do you have any thoughts on recent complying they've done? You and I had a discussion recently where I people forget about this, but there was a gentleman um, named Peter Warwick who uh, came from the Bank of Montreal or Bank of Bank of Montreal or I, I don't remember which Bank of Canada, something um, some Canadian banks that he had worked at when he went in as the chief of compliance i think there were two 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 mindsets when that occurred and one was this is bs they're just getting this guy there to make it look like they're trying to do some sort of compliance and then there was the other end of that which was oh it's so over for tether because if there actually is a compliance officer who's doing his job no one will want to use Tether anymore. I don't think that made a huge difference necessarily. I, I, I tend to side with the, he certainly was a big name to bring in and that looked good side. Um, but also, as you're kind of alluding to here, is that throughout the past year or two, Tether has really been pushing this narrative that they're constantly complying with any law enforcement requests. They're complying with them. They're working with law enforcement hand in hand. They're suggesting that they're freezing addresses that are being asked to be frozen. The um, sanctioned, any san OFAC sanctioned addresses they're now complying with. Um, there's a bunch of things that they're moving towards that at least make it sound like they're trying to comply with U.S. federal laws to a degree. Um, what do you think, though? I think that back in 2021, it was reported that Tether executives received target letters from the Department of Justice related to possible indictments for bank fraud. Since that time, there's been additional reporting. Specifically, I'm thinking of like the Wall Street Journal piece that targeted um, Harborn's activity at Signature for Tether that gave further credence to the idea that uh, Bitfinex Tether and friends of Bitfinex and Tether were engaged in a conspiracy to defraud the banks. But it's also been two and a half years since those target letters were initially reported and no indictments have been revealed publicly. There's also, in somewhat of a different track, always been this false perception that Tether was less likely to freeze your Tethers than like Circle would be to freeze your USDC. That Tether was in some sense more censorship resistance because they were more aligned with the ideals of the type of individuals needing censorship resistance who would be using stablecoins. However, that was always false. Tether always froze more addresses and more coins than Circle at any point during their existence. More recently, in like November of 2023, Tether onboarded the Secret Service and the FBI onto their platform. And since then, we've seen even more of an acceleration in the rate of Tether freezing. I think that if Tether was previously useful for less than legal activities, ranging from money laundering to capital flight to gambling to speculation, uh, that some of those activities are going to become meaningfully harder going forward as, the, as Tether finds it harder and harder to say no to various U.S. government fixtures. What I'm curious about is whether there is like a 
formal agreement that will eventually be revealed in which this access was provided as part of like a good faith negotiation as part of like a deferred settlement agreement or if it was more informal where as like a response to growing regulator and law enforcement pressure tether thought this collaboration would serve as like a relief valve um because it's been a long time since the target letters and no Mm -hmm. one's been indicted this word i think is a loaded word um, that I'm going to say. So I don't want to, I don't want to propose it like I believe it in any meaningful sense, but I think for a long time, the word honeypot has been thrown around when it comes to tether and this idea that criminals have utilized tether because they think that it's safe and it's, it has that, has that oh, we don't give a shit what authorities say to us, kind of uh, executives who seem like they're like Wild West figures, but um, maybe that has been a misperception on all of our parts. And perhaps they really, as, as you're pointing out, especially in the past few years, have been doing everything they can to work with authorities, not only to save themselves, but to get rich doing it <laughs> at the same time and not and not lose that money either. Um, I mean, all of these executives could now walk away from this project. Probably I had like hundred centimillionaires like they could have they could have hundreds of millions of dollars walk away forever at this point, I would suspect. Wasn't it Zeke that reported that Phil Potter's buyout from Tether in 2018 was worth 300 million? Yes. And that was when Tether was, what, $3 billion? Uh, yes. Okay. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So you're absolutely right. Like, there's a lot of money in there. The other thing to remember is the Sam Bankman freed of it all. He's now been found guilty of seven different felony charges. His firm, Alameda Research, was the single largest issuer of Tether. One of the primary things they used with those Tethers is directed them into, like, the... I'm going to call it the Chinese market, but that's that market through like Genesis block and entities like that. And so now there's also a lot of additional attention on some of those parts of Tether's use case. And if you want to give Tether the very most benefit of the doubt, or at least want to allow them to preserve that benefit of the doubt in public, perhaps you say, well, Tether was an unwitting tool. This was a company of unwitting tools. And now we have the opportunity for them to come in and help us. They can be productive tools instead. Um, And so Tether potentially has this opportunity under this pressure to be like, to begin collaborating, sharing, pointing out addresses they know and don't know, and in doing so, perhaps avoid their own prosecution. Another thing I want to mention here as well is that I think a lot of people discuss us and others who criticize Tether. Um, We have this kind of blanket name that we've been given, which is Tether Truthers, um, with the idea being that we're conspiracy theorists the same way that the people who say, you know, Bush did 9-11 are or whatever. Jeff um, Hill can't melt commercial paper. Right, right. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> That's true, actually. I just want to say that we've been right uh, on on most of the criticisms that we've given. Like, almost all of them, I think, were fair and accurate. Um, Tether being unbacked. It was unbacked. I mean, that's prov- provably the case. The idea that there was a solvency issue and that they were saved and bailed out by the, the cryptocurrency community, I mean, that is provable. They work with money launderers, uh, people like Zhao Dong who've been arrested. All of this is provable. None of this is something that we're making up. There's no conspiracy needed for most of the statements that we've ever claimed. As time has gone forward, we've also shifted our perspectives. For instance, I think you and me, there might be others that disagree with this, but you and me generally think that Tether is likely fully backed, like that they have all the assets that they need to cover the tethers that they have minted but like I you still said, think there's a chance there's some encumbrance sure. or other rehypothecation sure. going on at the sure. edges there, but broadly they have be. lots of assets they have many many assets realistically they could probably cover nearly any kind of nearly I'm saying nearly there's always exceptions to every rule but nearly any kind of major withdrawal 
I suspect they could meet most of those withdrawals. I suspect. Um, At least 24 hours again, worth. The question the questions remain for a lot of things like how did they how did they get all this money in those years how did they how did they make things work when they when they had a much riskier portfolio and markets would go down or whatever like they, when they got hacked when all these things have happened that have thrown their business model up in the air and thrown the ability for them to continue up in the air and they have had some really strange ways of maneuvering through those moments all of that is real there is no conspiracy and i i guess i'm like i'm tired of being gaslit by the public who love to be like see tether's fine it was fine all along like well no that's not true and i don't appreciate that moving of the goalposts where i do i our, our criticisms were not only valid but good they were good criticisms and um our concerns and our concerns that remain for Tether, things like the fact that they cannot get an audit, they cannot get an attestation, they won't share their real data with anyone about any of this stuff. Um, those are real cr concerns to have. There's nothing wrong with feeling concerned about those things, especially when it's a hundred billion dollar, supposedly, um, asset that everything in cryptocurrency relies on. Like, you should be looking at it very, very closely. And if you think it's conspiratorial to do that, I would say you're not reflecting enough on how important Tether is. And at the most basic level, you go back to one of our least popular episodes, stablecoins can fork your chain if they want to fork. Lay out the argument that basically these stablecoins being this powerful affects every single cryptocurrency that these stablecoins like have an interaction with. Stablecoins like Tether can be the arbiter of an Ethereum fork, a Bitcoin fork, all of these different things because of how important its role is. And they just onboarded the Secret Service and the FBI. You yeah. crypto folks are giving a lot of power to the U.S. Secret Service and the FBI, and none of you seem to care. That's weird. As we, as we approach 100 billion tethers, it has been a real learning experience uh, following this for so long. Uh, I guess this is going on, going on six years now that we've been following the tether saga. Um, six, seven years, uh, which is, Too yeah, many. like, a, it's actually like a significant portion of my life. <laughs> um, so I, I, I have learned a lot of things and I, part of my disappointment, um, over the past few months where we, we haven't been, we haven't been doing, um, we haven't been doing episodes, uh, and I, I, I was kind of MIA. Um, and I think part of that had to do with the fact that I, I, I saw, FTX and SBF, um, you know, in a sense, get crucified, rightfully so. N not like they they deserved what they deserved that they deserved their com comeuppance. Um, but I think when you reflect on I, like Binance and and CZ and how many laws they've broken. I mean, you'd probably be, it'd be easier to list the financial rules and regulations they've complied with than the ones that they've broken. Like they've probably broken every fucking financial law in the books. They didn't trade onion futures. That's the important one. That's where Cascoin comes in. I think when I saw that CZ was gonna walk away from that with a slap on the wrist, We've seen this before, like EOS offering, I, a, like acquiring so many billions of dollars and being, again, a slap on the wrist of what was it, like a, a $55 million fine or something, something crazy, um, $80 million, whatever it was. But you, like, what? So you're going to, you're not going to stop any criminal from illegally raising funds if you're going to just take a percentage, a tiny percentage of what they raised. Um, and if you think, CZ getting sentenced. He's not even going to. He's not even going to go to prison. Probably he might. Yeah, I. I'm not holding my breath. He can appeal if, if he does get sentenced, he can to appeal ov to over eighteen months. He can right. appeal. Right. He can appeal. Um, which that tells you everything you need to know. He's going to do probably almost no time in prison. This is my. That's what I'm trying to say. And he's he like if you think SBF broke laws and was a not necessarily. Yeah, a pretty bad guy. 
The only thing that CZ maybe didn't do, or probably did do, but just was smarter about it, is utilize customer funds in the same way. Um, and uh, he, he didn't have to deal with a bank run. Um, so uh, he, which again, shouldn't happen at a cryptocurrency exchange, but he's not going to do much time. I think you and I, after all these years of following Tether, I, I don't think they're going to, I don't think anything's going to, if it does ever go away, it will be just because it's not, it's a honeypot and it's not useful anymore. Um, but if, if it doesn't go away, I'm not going to be surprised. And if all these billionaires uh, or these executives are billionaires at the end of it and they get to be rich and influential, um, that also won't surprise me. So I guess I'm disappointed in regulators. I'm disappointed in the way the government has handled this stuff. I understand the wheels of justice grind slowly, but always increasingly fine or whatever the phrase is but i don't think that's always necessarily true sometimes they let certain people go just because they think they can get bigger fish or they can catch more fish and um you just never know you never ever know what the government is going to do and the other thing we should remind people and i know we've talked about this before in the context of tether but these international finance cases are not easy for the united states to prosecute like even FTX, where it had more obvious nexi to the United States than some of these other cases, still represented in some respects some challenging jurisdictional issues. Firms and executives who spend more and more time outside the United States makes that more difficult, makes the calculus look a little bit different if they can get cooperation. And we talked about this I, I like a little bit. I think that's kind of what happened with Arthur Hayes and BitMEX, right, is not that there weren't wasn't rule breaking, but that eventually they got to a point where they're like, well, we can definitely get them on this rule breaking and they'll cooperate and we can record a win. And then you see Binance and they do the same thing again. There was definitely other rule breaking, but we can prove this. We get the win. We get the cooperation. We get insight into their business going forward. I could see a point in the next year where the where SDNY or EDNY, whoever's leading it at this point, comes out and says, we negotiated a deferred settlement agreement with Tether Holdings Limited, Juan Carlo Davisini and Paolo Arduino. As long as they agree to our monitor, these terms, whatever, no one goes to prison, right? I, I think that's a logical endpoint for this still. And part of that comes from issues with like, political will in the prosecution part of it is these are just hard cases and part of it is just like they want to get a lot of people and so if you can find out how a whole bunch of people are moving their money maybe you let those three go and also just to to drive one other point home with ftx you had a, a ton of american citizens mm -hmm. running the the exchange for bitmex you had two you had one uk citizen one american citizen and one Bermudan citizen. Mm -hmm. For Binance, I think maybe part of the reason they were able to deal get CZ is that he's Canadian. And well, and Catherine Coley gave up the game. <laughs> and Catherine Coley, yeah, yeah, spoke up uh, very loudly to people that she needed to, I guess. Uh, speculating, but, of course. Yeah, we're speculating that she's yeah, yeah, the yeah. one who did that, and that's why who we knows? haven't heard it from her. Could have been, could have been anybody. Um, <laughs> But uh, I, I could suspect... have been anyone who was chief executive officer of Binance US during the exact period she was chief executive officer. Right, of Binance even though it US. definitely wasn't um, Brian Brooks. Uh, anyway, there's reasons that certain people are able to be apprehended by U.S. authorities. Ultimately, like even Do Kwan, where South Korea is the one that are they want the U.S. They want to ship him to the U.S. Um, so I. I think those ones all have reasons. Um, I can't necessarily fathom which government or why would give up the executives for Tether um, and why they would ever be shipped to America. These people are not in any way, you know, they're not coming to America, right? These people are not making their way over here ever. On that point, not to interrupt you, but Going back to Phil Potter's buyout, it mm. happens during a period where if you believe John Betts, 
Juan Carlo came to John Betts at Noble and says, how do we take all this money we have now and start making more money with it? Mm. And Phil Potter and John Betts were like, I don't think we can do that, especially with what we've been telling people. And Juan Carlo's like, yeah, but I bet we can do it. And then mm. Phil Potter gets bought out. They leave Noble. Noble shuts down. They end up at Dell Tech and they start more aggressively investing their reserves, right? And so Phil Potter during this period was like the executive like you're talking about with the strongest ties to the United States, the tether executive who most definitely wants to be able to come to the United States at some point during the remainder of his life. Yeah. The others, that's perhaps less true. Right. I don't think Paolo um, or Juan Carlo or even... <laughs> I mean, maybe Stewart. Maybe Stewart comes to the U.S. regularly. I don't. I, I don't know. But also, he's a lawyer, so it's a little bit different. Um, yeah. I, just in general, the major executives that we know, they have no reason to come here, and they have no reason for the countries they reside in. I think a lot of them reside in places like Switzerland, um, where like, why would the Swiss government send these people to America? They wouldn't. Um, and I've seen. Personally, how like Ravid and Oz Yosef, these two criminals who were associated with Crypto Capital Corp, um, which, yeah, again, we've discussed. You, you did mention this company already t today. Um, Reggie Fowler was also a part of this. But regardless, these two, uh, Ravid and Oz, made their way back to Israel after stealing all this money. And well, like... I don't even know if the U.S. bothers to ask to extradite these criminals, but if they do, Israel says couldn't possibly care less. These guys have hundreds of millions of dollars and they live in Israel now and they're spending their money. So why would we extradite them? Um, and I think that's how most countries operate when it comes to financial. I'm not suggesting Israel is particularly like the worst country about this. I think Switzerland does things like this and France and the U.K. Like financial crimes are lower on the totem pole for some reason. Um, so, you know, I, I just wouldn't expect anything from the U.S. in regards to these guys. But as you said, you never know. And uh, maybe there's going to be some backdoor deal that we find out about later. Who knows? Not me. Yeah. Until the $200 billion mark then, I guess uh, that's uh, that's our, our summary of... Seven long years of following Tether, unfortunately. Thankfully, though, I do want to announce that with my return, Cascoin is starting up again, and obviously we're looking forward to working with Tether to get Tether on Cascoin. Um, I think it's going to be a huge boon to our ecosystem, and that way you can stake your Cascoin uh, or stake your Tether on Cascoin, which I think is going to be um, really huge for uh, just for the whole ecosystem and cast X, the exchange. Um, again, sorry about the bankruptcy. I know I'm sending out new tokens to for old token holders. Um, and I appreciate all of your patience, everybody, you know, we're cast coins back. <laughs>